We're about to get started, ladies and gentlemen. AI in water. Over to digital guru, Gigi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for this exciting launch of this um, really unique company in digital water and our water sector. My name is Gigi Karmas Edwards. I'm an independent consultant. I'm also the founder and the co-chair of the Swan Digital Twin Working Group. And I work with water utilities and technology companies around the world on this specific topic of digital twin. So I'm very excited uh, to start this off by talking about why I feel like this is a very um, unique and special company that's launching today. It is a open software platform that really is targeted, but can work for small, medium, and large utilities where you could share with the company the data, like a GIS information, SCADA data, maybe even AMI data, and quickly, and in a very open way, translate that into a real-time hydraulic model of your water utility. But this is really unbelievable, because if you have a real-time hydraulic model ingesting real-time data, as you know, in my world, that is the essence of a digital twin. And we know how powerful a model-based analytic tool is. It can provide all kinds of information, which you're going to hear a lot more from, from the panelists here. But I think this is a very exciting um, start to a company that can really allow many utilities that did not have the opportunity to build a real-time hydraulic model to quickly do it in an open, um, in an open platform. So with that, I'd like to introduce my friend, Will Sarney, and he really doesn't need an introduction. Everyone knows Will, and I would love for him to tell his ideas about this. Thank you. Gigi, thanks. Um, and Andrew, I know how difficult it was for you to get up in front of a crowd <laughs> and do that, um, and we really appreciate it. So uh, thank you. It's uh, tough being shy. So um, Will Sarney. Um, I am a water strategy advisor for multinationals and water technology startups, early growth stage companies. I'm the CEO of Water Foundry, also the CEO of the Colorado River Basin Fund, which is a venture fund uh, primarily focused on digital uh, technologies. And uh, if you, in fact, do know me and you've heard me talk about um, a number of things that are important in the water sector, I tend to frame uh, our water challenges as wicked water problems uh, because they are in fact wicked whether it's water scarcity, water quality, or inequity in access to it. And in order to solve wicked water problems we need all stakeholders to be engaged and we need to democratize access to not just data but actionable information. And that's really key. So if you look at some of the big trends in the world of water and what has been happening over the past year and a half, digital, in my view, is the biggest. And uh, KTM showing up and being part of that digital solution set and focusing on democratizing access to data and actionable information is really going to be key for us to solve some of the more pressing challenges we have in the utility sector. And one of the things I'm really impressed with is really not just the technical side, but the business strategy in really targeting small to mid-sized utilities. Because there's a tendency to go after the big utilities, but we're never really going to solve wicked water problems unless we get to all sizes of utilities. So excited to be here and look forward to the conversation. And please, there's no slides. It's a conversation. So with that, Gavin. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, Gavin Van Tonder, uh, previous president of uh, ITRON Water, uh, left uh, or was poached three years ago to go and put the water infrastructure in place in Neom in Saudi Arabia. So I've been there for three years and the job is to basically bring water to the desert uh, and uh, uh, do it in the most efficient way possible. So uh, having been in ITRON for a very long time, uh, previously Slumberger, uh, we did a lot of work in Africa, a lot of work in uh, South America, a lot of work in Asia in very uh, low income areas where water utilities are very, very poor. And uh, 
it's uh, it's very difficult to see that because they have no idea what their network looks like. They have no idea uh, really where the water's going. Their losses are sometimes 80%, by the way. Uh, and uh, we've done a lot of work in that area to try and reduce those losses. Um, but what we see now with the advent of 5G and IoT, uh, and, and, and people will have different opinions of this, but uh, 5G will enable us to get the cost of infrastructure extremely low. Uh, 5G will give us the depth and the penetration we need and the, bro and the bandwidth we need in order to be able to read a range of sensors in the water industry uh, with uh, very long battery lifetimes. Uh, that would feed into IoT. Uh, but the problem we faced in ITRON is we had, and everyone has all these smart meters and smart sensors, and at the end of the day, what you do with a smart meter is you invoice customers. And that's about as far as the data goes. Uh, and a smart meter is so much more than that, and you have all that data. What you have now with, uh, with cloud-based platforms like Catium is that you are able to input that data into a network and really see where the water is going. Uh, as long as you have a GIS point on each of those meters, which is not difficult to do, you can see where the water is flowing and you can start to analyze uh, the whole network just with one small program. And I say it's small because it's going to get a lot larger, <laughs> isn't it? But we've used it uh, in Neom. Uh, and we use it to, because we're implementing brand new networks and distribution networks, and then we use it to see where the resilience is, where, will, where the water quality uh, will, will deteriorate, where there's dead ends, where we have to flush networks. It's a, it's, it's a software that you can already do that with. Uh, and the benefit is that, it, that, that even like kind of non-engineer people like me can really understand it. You know, I, I don't need to go down into the details and start looking at these complicated models and that, because it, it's so visually um, beneficial for you that, that it's, uh, it, it just, I can present it to the CEO of Neom and he, and he really understands immediately where the issues lie and he believes us immediately and it makes meeting, CEO meetings, instead of 30 minutes, it makes it five minutes. So it's really, and the fact that anybody can use it and implement it is, is just amazing. So um, feel free to go out there and try it out, but I think I'm going to hand over to people that are actually responsible for the software uh, who, who will uh, tell you more details about it. Thank you, Gavin and uh, Will. I think they gave us a, a very good in introduction into the, the problems we are trying to solve. Um, the, the application we want, you know, small and medium utilities to have the same access to this data as the big players. We think that digital twins and these, you know, the, the advice and information, the analytics you can get from them shouldn't just be for those who have a large amounts of money and big budgets. We expect small, medium, and even large to benefit from this application. We're taking a totally different approach where we want the platform to be open for all to use. Doesn't matter if you don't have any models or you already have something developed. We have a way to work with you to, to get uh, an operation, you know, get operational decisions happening and working right now. And much to the, uh, Gavin's point, it doesn't just have to be now engineers who are holding all the answers and gatekeeping the decisions that we need to make. The, the world is moving too fast for that. So now we want an application where an operator can come in and still get the same insights and information that he needs right now if there's an issue. So we hope that uh, when people give it a try, they'll see just how much easier we're, we're making life for people. We want a clean, beautiful interface that you can see up above me, that if you have quick questions, you can jump in onto any browser, click a location of main, and it will tell you all the insights you need. What's the pressure? What's the flow? If there's a break, how is it going to impact me? And which customers will be impacted? Or if you're looking at events such as fire flows or bursts or flushing, uh, that is totally approachable for anyone without a huge amount of training to get it done. Um, and then, Damien, you want to tell us some of the fundamentals of our platform as well? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Luke. Uh, so KTM is a company based in Valencia in Spain. And uh, it's been under construction for over a year and in June this year, we opened the platform to early adopters, and we're very happy to welcome over 150 utilities around the world to, who were happy to use the platform. Um, the company was founded by Roberto Tortoya, who's here, who's very shy. Um, so uh, Luke and I are speaking on his behalf. Um, and he designed the company with three underlying principles. The first one is the concept of simplicity. 
that you do not need to be a hydraulic modeling expertise or have a PhD in computer science to run these types of platforms. So a lot of work has been done in streamlining the UI to keep it as simple and clean as possible. The second guiding principle is around accessibility. Because we sell and serve uh, either progressive, uh, small and medium utilities, but also the underserved utilities around the world, we wanted to make sure it was accessible even if you didn't have a very strong uh, internet connection, a very powerful computer, or you didn't have a data center on premise. Um, and beyond accessibility, the last one I think is, is, I think is probably the most important is this concept of openness. Open in the sense, from a technological perspective, KTM is built on majority of open source frameworks, software frameworks. To open in terms of our APIs are open and we invite the open source communities or software developers to build and extend their models and their applications on top of our platform. It's open as well uh, in terms of uh, providing visibility on what the team is working on, what features we're working on, and our users are invited to vote on our features and suggest any feature they would like to see in, in, in the platform. The last thing I, I wanted to say was those three guiding principles uh, have generated, produced a, what I think is a novel uh, business model in the, price, in the water industry, a very simple pricing model, whereby 85% of the core features that you'll see in KTM are oh, for free, absolutely for free. We have a second package, which we're calling the premium package, um, which allows you to integrate more data sets than in the free model. And then we also have uh, enterprise packages for more complex deployments, which I think a lot of you are, are, are familiar with. So those are the three uh, guiding principles. And uh, Gigi, I don't know if you want to open it up to questions. Yeah, what do you guys think? Do you have any questions for this? Do you, you know, let me come down and I can actually share the microphone with you. Andrew. <laughs> what does this mean for the end consumer? So you talked about the utility advantages, but what about the end consumer? Will talked about democratization. Is there any interface or some way that the end consumer can interact with the system? Excellent question. So uh, transparency and visibility is a big deal. The problem is, is that a lot of people want it, but very few people offer it for obvious reasons. So we provide our users with two options. One is to keep their networks private and just share it and collaborate with their team members. But in the future, we're offering uh, progressive-minded utilities and municipalities the opportunity to publish the state of their water network, their water quality in real time as part of an open data, uh, uh, data set. And, and we expect to see a lot more municipalities doing that in the future. Do I hear a game changer? I mean, this is really amazing. It's a completely different way of working. Any other questions? Any ideas? Any suggestions that you have for the team? I, I have a question. Okay. Yes. Sorry. When you said end consumer, did you mean the customer in the house or did you mean the, uh, the water utility? So I think the customer in the house generally doesn't care about water. As long as he turns on the tap and it's there, he's happy. Uh, but when you get old and you've had many houses, you suddenly realize that you've, you, few of those houses have had leaks in it and uh, damage in it. Uh, and the pressure can vary dramatically, which affects your refrigerator or your washing machine or everything. So having access to this, a, a network like this with pressure actually demonstrated on the network in real time, you can always tell what the pressure is in the whole network. And if you get a break anywhere, you can tell what you have to shut down. So the, we don't call them consumers anymore, we call them customers, they're much better. Uh, so the customer, the benefit they get is when there's a break in the line, you can see it and you can see the impact it's gonna have and you can design the network with resilience such that even if there is a break in the line, the customer will never get affected from that break because you've designed resilience in it, and this enables you to see whether you have resilience in your network. Can we um, use this to benchmark with other utilities? The question is, can Neom use this to benchmark with other utilities? Um, 
I, I don't think we can use this because we are not building something that is very similar to other utilities. Yeah, my name is Rudy Dijkstra, I'm from Queens. So we perform condition assessment and uh, with the data we also uh, work on uh, prediction models. Is it uh, um, uh, possible to integrate this kind of data sources within the platform? Uh, yes, uh, one of the future abilities we want in this uh, source is uh, to be able to interact with other providers, software providers, information sources. We want KDM to be a source of trust that you can come to and get any information out. So if it is a predictive model for uh, asset management or optimization or workforce management, we want you to be able to come in and work from here. So this is more about that openness where we want anyone to come in and build on top of. So if you're a supplier of anything that you think we can build on top, we want to hear from you and, and be able to help um, our customers uh, work with you uh, through this platform for sure. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, Tom. You, uh, Damon, you said you launched with uh, 150 different utilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you talk a bit about those guys who the first adopters geographically, the size, and kind of what, how you convince them to adopt before the the launch here? <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, there's a difference between convincing someone and persuading someone. Uh, at first, we had to definitely had to persuade utilities. They were reluctant uh, to, to upload data to a company they don't know or trust with no brand equity or customers. So at first, it was a bit of an uphill uh, battle. Uh, but once we got the first five or ten, I think other utilities started taking notice. And then things uh, were much, much easier uh, down the road. Typically, uh, the ideal, the typical utility uh, is, uh, operates a network uh, at a town between 50,000 to about 500,000 uh, inhabitants. Um, they are equally spread uh, around the world. We do have a concentration in North America, in Southern California, in Ontario, and other parts of the United States. We also have some uh, three or four utilities here in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, some large ones as well in, in, in Spain, uh, in the Balkans, in Ghana, in the Philippines, in the Middle East. Um, and we expect to see a lot more demand coming from the emerging uh, markets or emerging uh, economies. Um, so yes, thank you. Yeah, and I actually what I want to say another comment about this because I'm part of a use case that we're working on right now in Southern California. And usually when a utility has a hydraulic model, they use that in the expansion and design phase, they hire an engineering company, you build the hydraulic model, you use it to test out certain regulations like your fire pressures and things like that. Um, then they sort of put it aside. And in order for them to take that hydraulic model and turn it into a real-time hydraulic model and then ingest real-time data, there's quite a few steps and it's a really big challenge. And here, within just a few days, I witnessed it myself. They actually took, in this case, they took another existing model, but they could have also just taken GIS information and SCADA information, and quickly developed, within just a few days, a real-time hydraulic model based on the data that they were collecting. So that's why I really feel like this is a, a huge game changer in our market, and I just I cannot wait to see more and more utilities use it. Yes, I knew I was for some questions. <laughs> We, uh, we spend a lot of energy and resources to, uh, to bring water into cities, only for you know, a third of it to be lost in the, in the network. How can this impact uh, water loss and non-revenue water? Uh, also from a societal, societal perspective, not only just pure cost. Um, I think having the sensors in the network and having meters in the network uh, and being able to integrate them into a model like this uh, allows you to separate out into different uh, district meters areas or pressure management zones uh, allows you to say okay if I'm going to have a district meter area of 1000 houses or properties uh, then I need to put valves in certain areas so it gives you the visibility of where you can put the valves uh, in step one. Step two then uh, allows you to adjust the network such that you can monitor the losses from a water input to a water consumption. Uh, and then 
then you target the areas that are the highest loss areas. Uh, if you just have the model all on its own like this, uh, without having the, the meters uh, with, the, with the measurements going through, uh, it's very difficult. And that's where smart meters come into play. So what we've done in Africa was we, we don't put smart meters on every house. We put smart meters on 10% of the houses because you only need them on 10% of the houses to start seeing where the flow rates are going and start getting a, an idea of a district metered area and where the losses are occurring. So it's a very inexpensive way and having this model allows you to identify where to put those meters. You don't have to put them everywhere. So it allows you to start on a gradual basis. Uh, and what we actually did in Africa in the past was that we, we didn't charge to do this. We only shared in the savings on the losses uh, and in the benefit of uh, invoicing the people that were not paying uh, because their, their meter was not working or there was uh, tampering with the, with the device. So it, it gives you the visibility as a step one to where you should be focusing on the non-revenue water. Excellent. Any other questions, comments? Anything you'd like to share? Should I talk about digital twin? No. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I, I think this, um, first of all, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Andrew, for bringing in the crowd. Um, thank you. And we'd love for you to talk to all of our panelists here. Go see the booth, see how it's actually working. And we have drinks available as well. So please treat yourself to some great drinks. Talk to you soon. Thank you.